Guys, I want to talk to you tonight about the book of Jonah. You like that? Yep, thank you. <laughs> actually, I'm not going to actually give a word on Jonah as much as I'm going to, since we've been talking so much about Nineveh and we've been talking so much about the seven cities called Nineveh that the shadow went over here in the United States and the seven cities called Salem before that. And then it went over Jonah and it happened on 4-8 and there's 48 verses in the book of Jonah, all those different things, right? But there's this really interesting thing in the book of Jonah that that I find that we need to understand that now, as a sign has passed us, what needs to happen now? Because we really need to hope. Now, you guys will remember that whenever, whenever the Lord, whenever Jonah spoke to that hateful king, Sennacherib, and he talked to the brother, he said, yet 40 days and you will be overturned. Meaning God's just going to just plow it up. It's over. You just, you're going to be plowed up the way that you did the 29 cities in Israel. That's what's going to happen, and that's what I want to see happen. God is a God of justice, and I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to get a front row seat to watch this thing. And, you know, we always judge Jonah because he's the reluctant prophet. It would be a whole lot like, whole lot like, God Almighty taking a Jew today and saying, I want you to go into Gaza. I want you to find the leaders of Hamas and tell them that Jesus loves them. Say, in the wake of October 7th. Like, no, I'm here to hunt down the leaders of Hamas. If they broke into their house, they'll break into my house too. And no, justice needs to be done. And it's like, yeah, justice needs to be done. And justice is going to happen. But what I would like for you to do is go in there and deliver a message of repentance. And he actually argues with God and says, I know what you're going to do. I'm going to go in there and those people are going to, if there is even a smidgen of a chance that they might repent, there's a smidgen of a chance that you will not destroy them. And so in Jonah chapter four, Jonah actually says, did I not tell you this is what you would do? That's why he says that in Jonah chapter four. He's like, I told you, I told you, I knew there was a chance this could happen. And I told you, no, I do not want to be a part of that. And I'm, I'm not happy over this. Because where was the chance for our people to repent? And why, why would you not, why, how in the world could you show, how, how in the world could you show mercy on the monsters that murdered our people? And our people know you. Uh, you can say he was out of whack if you want to. Uh, he sounds like a good dude to me. He sounds like a normal human being. He sounds like a grown man who does not understand and also thinks that he has a big choice in this. And he's going to be taught very soon. No, you really don't. you got a choice of the position of your heart, but the position of you is going to be in Nineveh. And this is one of the things that we need to understand about the sovereignty of the Lord. That God Almighty will say, oh, you don't really don't have a choice in you being here. You have a choice on if you're on my side or not while you're there in that. Huh. I love what Jesus says about Judas Iscariot when Jesus is sitting at the table. And he says this amazing thing. He says, you know, the scriptures must be fulfilled concerning what I have to suffer. <sighs> but woe to the one who makes it happen. I want you to think about what Jesus said. He said, oh, let me tell you, man, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to give up my life. It's, it was what I was born to do. I'm going to get this done. But you will be held responsible if you're a part of it. Meaning... Judas had a choice. A lot of people don't understand. I want to say this. None of us understand the sovereignty of God in so many complex issues. But it can be understood in this way. Now, the scriptures are going to be fulfilled, but you have a choice on which side you're going to be on. And he gets both of those things done at the same exact time. One of the things that I like to say, you know, and when I, when I talk to my predestination friends, which I'm also a predestination guy because the Bible says that we've been predestined before the foundation of the world. But a lot of us will use that as an opportunity to say, then it really doesn't matter how we live. It really doesn't matter what we do because God is sovereign and whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. K sera, sera. Say la vie. Say la vie, say the old folks. It goes to show you never got said my son. No, God predestines 
knowing the choices that you're going to make. You're the one that doesn't know the choices you're going to make. And you're the one responsible for the choices that you make. We still are human beings in relationship with him. And somehow God can just make all that work perfectly because he's God. But know of a certainty, my friends, that we have choices. I mean, if we're actually going to repent and if our lives are going to be changed, that's on us. It's like, well, I don't think God gave me enough grace for it or, man, there was too much, too many good shows on Netflix, man, or whatever that is. No, 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 it's on us. What we take serious and what we do not take serious and how we take things is on us. The lens we view things because we're offered so many different lenses. That's why we have to be dedicated and consecrated and committed to how should I see this? Well, Jesus is the light. So while you can be too churchy, you can never be too Jesus-y. <laughs> Jesus. Just can't. Just can't do it. Like, I, you can't see him enough. You can't think about him enough. Like, well, I can't even live life like a normal man. I'm going to tell you this. You won't live life like a normal man until you see Jesus everywhere. Man, I'm still 2,000% a dude. And I like being a guy. And I like being the age I am. Like, wouldn't you like to be younger? You know... <sighs> I'd like to be younger in a sense of I would like to be stronger than I am. But I think that anybody that is in their late 50s that pines for the good old days of their 20s and 30s are knuckleheads. I don't think they're remembering right. It's kind of like, man, I'm, I'm coming up. On, I'm at my 40th, uh, my 40th reunion, you know, uh, high school reunion coming up. Been big time 40 years, man, since we were in high school. Danny, you believe that, man? 40 years, man. Craziness. Like, okay, 40 years. And I'm like, don't you wish we were back in school? No! You're nuts if you wish you were back in school. Like, what is wrong with you? So I think that the lens that we, how we view things is either going to be life or it's going to be death. And that's up to us. It's not up to anybody else. Do you guys believe that? I'm so glad that Jesus offers us life and gives us a chance to see life. And all we got to do, here's the deal, we just have to accept it on the terms of Jesus. You know, I had somebody ask me on, uh, at the baptism, somebody that was not planning on being baptized, um, somebody that comes from a very proud community that is very anti-Jesus, and she said, will Jesus save a so-and-so? And I'm not going to tell you the words she said. And I asked her this, will you lay down your life for Christ? She said, yes. And I said, then Jesus will save a so-and-so. And I thought, my God, I need to write that down. That was brilliant. <laughs> because I promise you, it came out of my mouth so fast, and it was so powerful. Don't you just love it when the Holy Spirit just speaks through you, and you're like, whoa, man, that was the Lord. And I'm like, man, that was crazy good. And so anyway, she's like, all right, I'm going to get baptized. And she did. She got baptized. I'm like, there you go. Give your heart to King Jesus. Give your life to the Lord. Fall in love with God. Accept him on his terms. Yeah, you're going to go through changes, but here's the deal. You're never going to stop going through changes, whether you accept him or not. And the idea that you're going to hold on to exactly how you was and exactly the situation you're in is ridiculous. I remember growing up in Joshua, I remember that, that you know, it was a small town, and, you know, the, most of the kids at the time of my graduation were the same kids that I went to uh, Cub Scouts with and played, you know, a little bitty tiny uh, baseball with and all that kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, we were tight. The day after high school, we were all gone. And I'll tell you, I would have never believed it. I would have been, listen, we will know each other for the rest of our life. I sit down at my grandson's uh, baseball game the night before last. I sat right next to a girl. And she looked at me and she goes, hey. And I said, hey. And this was on Monday night. And she said, you don't recognize me, do you? And I said, no, but you recognize me. And I said, do I owe you money? I always ask people that. She said, no. I said, okay, we're good. What's your name? And she said, Holly Palmer. Now, I went, to, I went to high school with Holly Palmer. I haven't seen Holly Palmer in over 40 years. And I actually sat next to her on Monday night at my grandchild's baseball game. 
And we started talking about old friends and started talking about those of us that are still alive and those of us that are not. And we started talking about what's happened. I mean, literally, she's like, I said, oh, she was telling me, man, I, I follow your ministry. I love what you do, Troy. Uh, it's incredible, yada, yada, yada. And she went through this whole deal. And I said, what about you? What have you been doing for the past 40 years? What an incredible thing to ask somebody. So what you been doing the past 40 years? And we had such a great talk. And it was so good. And then at the end of all of that, after it was all over with, we began to speak on just how the Lord has redeemed us. And friends, I just, I, I have to tell you this, and you guys have to know this. Man, if people cannot see how we are redeemed and Jesus is alive in us, we have nothing to offer. And if we're not so full of hope, you know, people actually received a lot of the message that I gave by actually thinking I was given a doom and gloom. And I'm like, really? You heard me preach all that and you didn't hear the hope that is in King Jesus? That's a heart. That's a hearing ear issue. Like all I, all I see in you, Troy, is you're bringing a mean message. Okay, I'm not bringing a mean message. I'm telling you that this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying repent and get really good at it. Really, 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 really good at it. There's two things, uh, a couple of things, guys, that we need to be really good at. One is dunamis power and walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and demonstrating <laughs> the goodness of God. Another thing we got to get good is we got to be really good at giving people hope. And then we got to be really good at showing people how to turn on a dime and just go, whoa, 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 whoa. I recognize right now any place in my life that I am hopeless, I am under the influence of a lie, and I repent. Any place in my life where I want to see somebody burn rather than turn, I need to repent because it's not the heart of the Father. Any place in my life where I think that anybody deserves more judgment than I do, I need to repent. Any place in my life where I decided it's okay for me to be miserable, it's not okay for you to think that you have the right to be miserable. No, you do not have the right to be miserable. Or I want to say this, just because you have the right doesn't mean that Jesus is in it. Don't be miserable. Tell the person next to you, be happy. Amen. That's not just a, let's just be happy. You know, let's, uh, no, no, it's this. I am blood bought. I am full of the Holy Ghost. Look at what Jesus has done in my life. I get to live a front row seat of signs and miracles and wonders. I get to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. No, I'm not happy. I'm surrounded by knuckleheads. I don't know what to do about that, but it's the day that I live in. But I refuse to be miserable. And I think one of the greatest ways that you can rebuke the devil is to just walk in the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And go, just not going to be. Well, pastor, dude, listen to me. I've been a pastor at this church for 28 years, and I've been in full-time ministry since 1986. I, and I have been rescuing kids out of sexual slavery. I know every bad story that you can imagine. And if you think you know some bad stories, I guarantee you I'd like to combat who knows the worst stories. Except for, I don't do that. You know why I don't do that? Because I don't think about the torture, I don't think about the abuse, I don't think about the monsters and the American monster of lust that is in this nation and how nobody from the pulpit even speaks against pornography anymore because everybody's addicted to it. I ain't, I ain't addicted to it. And I'll tell you right now, I've got some issues, but that ain't one of them because I know what pornography is. Man, I, I know what pornography is and I'm not fooled by it. And I know how to have sexuality without having pornography. Well, I also think, too, I also think everybody in this church deserves a pastor that does not look at pornography. All of you men deserve a pastor that doesn't lust after your wife. All of you ladies deserve one that doesn't lust after your husband, too. And that's a new thing now, but that's not my thing. It ain't going to be me. Whatever my problem is, it ain't going to be that either. <laughs> like, I don't understand y'all. <laughs> So, so in the book of Jonah, you thought I forgot. So in the book of Jonah, in the midst of all that, you got these 48 verses. It goes through this whole thing, and then it goes to, as I was telling you guys on Sunday, man, Nineveh is no joke. And I've done a tremendous study I, on Nineveh. I, 
I've, I've been to the British Museum, spent, spent an entire day just looking at the panels that was inside Sennacherib's palace and looking at it and just going, wow, those pictures that I showed them to you on Sunday, they're so graphic. Pictures of Jews being skinned alive, pictures of Jews being beheaded, and that was literally the place in the palace where Jonah stood in 763 BC on June the 15th and pointed his prophetic finger at that, at that God King Nephilim, demonic beast that he was, who so gloried in all that, and said, you got 40 days, pal. That's really all I have to say to you, 40 days. Clock is ticking. And I'm gonna go up here and I'm gonna set, and I'm gonna let a gourd form over my head so that I have some kind of shade. I don't need much, all I need is a gourd. Pretty cool, nice fat pumpkin might be nice. But I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to sit here from the first of Elul until 40 days later, the Day of Atonement, Judgment Day. I'm going to get a front row seat. And to his horror, it went like this. The people repented. And after the people repented, then the king repented. And then after the king repented, God came back and started dealing with Noah. And he says this in the King James, and I just, I, I love it in the King James. Noah, Jonah. <laughs> Does thou do us well to be angry at the gourd? I just love the King James. Does thou do us well to be angry at the gourd? Because that was his final straw. He's like, okay, first of all, first of all, all my people were slaughtered. We had October 7th happen over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then God, uh, uh, you didn't see fit to wipe out the army of 185,000 Assyrians with one angel until they got to the last city of Jerusalem. Okay, that didn't set right me. Have you ever had something in your life that you're like, whoa, I thought I knew you better than this. I, th I thought you would always intervene at, at some point. I thought you were going to intervene. Oh, no, he's a human being. I'm telling you, this was big stuff. And then he's like, I went through all that hell. And then I said, I'm not, no, you came to me and told me to go. I told you, no, I'm not going there. And then I went out in the boat. And then you prepared a great fish for me. Thank you! Out of all the wonderful things you could have ever done for me, and out of all the things you could have ever created for me, you created a sea monster for me. And then I had to tell the guys I was the problem in the boat. And then I told them, well, y'all are an ungodly bunch of pagans, just sacrifice me to the fish god. And then the fish god showed up and swallowed me. Then, after I apparently died, this, I came back to life inside a fish. And then it was booking up to the beach and I saw the mouth up and up and it vomited me out. Kaboom, boom, 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 boom. I'm naked. I'm bleached white, hair is falling out, and I stink. I'm like, where am I? All right, Nineveh. <laughs> it's like, of course I am. Perfect. You want me to give a word? I got a word, you're gonna die. <laughs> I'm out. 40 days. I'm gonna see it happen. So all I want to do is sit here. All I need is a little bit of shade. I mean, it's Iraq. All I need is something. And then there's this cool piece of wood I got my back up against, and this vine is here, and then this pumpkin starts growing over my head, and I'm like, it's perfect. And then you prepared a worm and sent a worm to my pumpkin, and it withered and died. Now, I want to just say this, man. 
You can grab all you want about Jonah. I saw the church fall out when Trump didn't become president. That was all it took. We're out. God's abandoned us. We left. What a, whew. I nearly said a bad word. It wasn't a bad word, but it was, wasn't appropriate for church. What a bunch of cowards. No, what if it gets hard? Certainly we can never serve our God if something gets difficult and hard and if everything doesn't go the way that we think it should go. King Jesus, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have, lasted, you wouldn't have lasted five seconds in the story of Jonah. So when God Almighty came to Jonah and said, Jonah, does thou do us well to be angry at the gourd? Jonah said, I do well, Lord, even unto death. <laughs> God, that's a beautiful story to me. <laughs> God's like, hey, Jonah, just checking on you, buddy. It seems like you're kind of mad about the whole gourd thing. He says, no, oh, everything's perfect. I'm going to die. <laughs> I do well, Lord. He's like, no, God, I'm riding this all the way down. This is going to kill me. Congratulations, you did it. I tried to walk with you. Uh, you know, I did my best, man, and you wanted to kill me. So that's, what this, that's what's going to happen. This is going to kill me. And then God Almighty says, you know, I had less problem with a Ninevite Nephilim king than I've had with you. <laughs> and for the very first time, you know, at the, at the end of the book of Jonah in chapter 4, the 48th verse, it says, and God Almighty says to him, when God says his case, he says, should I destroy that great city of Nineveh? We're more than however many people it says. And he says, and besides that, there's a lot of cows. And then the book's over. That's God's argument? Dude, there's cows out there. You gonna say that to a brother after the hell he went through? I can't. Yeah, you're liable to die. This might kill you, but I can't kill that place. It's got cows in it. God is hilarious to me. What he's actually saying is this, Jonah, what a waste. What a horrible waste. A waste of humanity, a waste of resources. There's so much there. Man, listen, Israel is desolate. It's been wiped out. Don't you think there needs to be some kind of kingdom transference here? Do you not see that it'll just be a horrible waste if all we do is wipe it out and he just says, and there's lots of cows there and then it's the end. Why does that book end? I'm like, I remember when the first time I read the book, I was like, there's something missing in my Bible. I'm like, where's the next chapter? I'm like, not only is Jonah a horrible prophet, he's a worse writer. <laughs> Nobody ends a book like that. It never, says, it never says anything after that. It just says God showed up and said, I don't want to destroy it. There's a lot of cows out there, and it's over. Like, that is the strangest book I've ever read. I remember being freaked out over it and asking people, why does it end with, and many cows, and it's over? Like, where's the rest of the book? And every pastor I went to just didn't know. And he's like, well, you know, the, the, you know they had all kinds of, I want to tell you why. Because I fasted, and I prayed, and I sought the Lord, and I remember specifically when God spoke this to me. I remember the moment that this happened. Don't you, guys, we need to remember the moments that God truly speaks to us and it, and it becomes a great game changer. And it, and it worked like this. When I told him to go to Nineveh, he said, no, I'll go to Joppa. When I told him to go to Nineveh, he said, no, I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna go do that, and then he got in the fish. When I told him to go to Nineveh, he said, no, I'm gonna do this. When I told him to give a word of repentance, he just told him, he told him they had 40 days. And then when I showed up and said, can we deal with your anger issues now? Hey, this might be a good day for us to talk about your anger issue, Jonah. And he said, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to die. Now, that's a hard-headed man right there. No, we're not talking about this. I'm going to die. He's talking to God like that. And then God says, look, I don't want to destroy Nineveh. They've repented. And what a waste it would be. And then the book is over. You know why? Because it's the first time Jonah had nothing else to say. So his horrible story is over. It's the first time he did not have a rebuttal. So his book ends. There's a lot of us, man, our book would end if we would just shut up. And we would just say, okay, I'm with the program. I'm with the program, man, and I'm not going to get out of the program. 
and I'm done, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I always have something else to say. I have nothing else to say. Can the story end here? And God's like, yes, it can end right here. Let's go on to another story. The way the Bible is written is just as prophetic as the words that are, are, are within it. This is also a character of repentance. So remember again, this is how it worked when it comes to the nation. It started with the people and then it went to the king and then it went back to the church and God's like, you've always secretly or publicly wanted these people wiped out. I need a heart change out of you. I see that same thing happen among us. I see it happening among us. And if you're like, there's no way in that, in that White House that those people will ever bend the knee to the Lord. Sennacherib did. I want you to think about that. Sennacherib, his entertainment was watching people get filleted alive. His entertainment was slavery. His entertainment was sexual slavery. His entertainment was however he could have dominion over human beings and prove to everybody that he was the most dominant monster on the planet. He repented. How is it that we can believe the stories of the word of God, but we can't believe it in our everyday life? I'm telling you guys, when he said 40, you remember that day, 40? 40 days from the 8th of April is actually May 18th on the, Greg, on the Gregorian calendar. I was looking up and going, what, what things happen on May 18th? What is that? And I looked it up, and it's, I kid you not, it's National Astronomy Day. I mean, that's a coincidence. 40 days from the Great American Eclipse. It's actually the day we're supposed to be looking at astronomy. It's Astronomy Day. I'm like, ah, that's funny, God. You're funny. Thank you. But that night at sundown, guys, Pentecost begins. It's the same day. And guys, we have to believe in the power of the Holy Spirit for our own lives and for our own families. We have to believe that the Spirit of the living God can sweep a nation and cause us to speak a language that the people that have never understood us finally understand us. We have to believe in that. And if you're like, no, it's all too far gone and I just wanna see it all wiped out. Okay, Jonah, your story's not over. You still got another chapter or two. I would suggest you just go, okay. Instead of, did thou do us well to be angry at the Gordon? I do us well, Lord, even unto death. Dude, that, that's cold-blooded. That is a guy who is done. He is so bitter and so hurt and so wasted by the horrors of this world and by the consequences of the choices he has made. He's just like, I just want to die. I want to just speak this to you as a body of King Jesus. Repent and live. Repent and live. Give your heart to King Jesus. Love the Lord. Repent and tell the Lord, I love you. I need you. I can't have anybody else. Repent and live. Don't be afraid of the word repent. It's not a cuss word. Die in Jesus' name. And just give it up. And just go, it ain't about me. I'm, I'm going to love whatever God loves, and I'm going to hate whatever God hates. Be zealous for the Lord and for his house. Be passionate. And just go, I, I, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be this. I don't want that. You, all I want is Jesus. That's what I want. Quit comparing your life to anybody else and blaming God and blaming his character that God has been better to somebody else than he has been to you. Don't do that. Repent. If you've been through the horrors of life, as all of us have, do not be bitter and mad unto death as Jonah was determined to be. Do not do that because Jesus is offering you in this year of the open door, an open door. And let me tell you what that open door is. It's Jesus. He's offering you him. It's not a quick fix. It's not an instant thing. What it is, is, is it's life. And it can be worked out. And transformation can actually happen. And the continuing change can happen. I had, a, I had a friend named uh, Sharon Bolin was her name. And Sharon, Sharon and I were friends 30, 40 years ago. She was the first person to ever put me on a radio show, and it was actually her radio show. And it was called The Change, and it was a really good radio show. And Sharon put me on there, I mean, back before anybody did, and she was really good to me. And I thought about that, just the name The Change. 
the change, where the change happens and where you do this, this thing where it just, you change. Transformation, the change, the repentance, the way that it's supposed to work. Sharon, is that you, Sharon Bowen? Are you freaking kidding me? Wow. I haven't seen you in decades. I can't, I just mentioned you. I was just thinking about you. I've been actually thinking about you through this whole sermon. I was just, I was just talking about that lady I knew 30 years ago. Man, I feel God. I'm talking about, whoa. Sharon, thank you for having me on your radio show 30 some odd years ago. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for that amazing thing we did at the, football, at the baseball stadium. You remember that thing? Thank you for teaching me, because I might not have learned it had you not taught me, you, you better do this thing right. Thank you. It is a great honor to have you here tonight, ma'am. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's crazy. I have not seen you this entire, it's like you were invisible sitting there. That's nuts. I was talking about Sharon Bowling. I've just been thinking about her through this whole sermon, and she's sitting right over there. And then my eyes went past her, and I thought, my God, that chick looks just like Sharon Bowling. And then I went, that is Sharon Bowling. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's Jesus, man. That's the Lord. That's the Lord. That's remarkable. Mm. Hallelujah. Uh, let's, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Hmm. Father God, sir, I come to you, Lord, and I just love you and I praise you. Thank you, God, for that amazing moment that just happened. Thank you, Lord, for that. And Father God, sir, we remember your history with us. We remember your history with us. God, you've been so good to us. And God, we will not have a divided loyalty between the world and you. We will not. We will not. God, we choose you, Lord, and we say thank you, Lord, because, because you chose us, and we wouldn't be able to do it if you hadn't chose us. We wouldn't be able to love you if you didn't love us. Thank you for that. Father, I, I pray, God, that this revelation in the book of Jonah, how the repentance thing worked, the people, the king, and then the prophets of God, the hearts of the people who do your work. I pray, Father God, sir, that that would be real among all of us, Lord. And Father, I'm grateful, sir, for your presence. And I thank you, Lord. And I love you, sir. Holy Spirit, you are so welcome here tonight. You're so welcome. Let your spirit rule and reign let there be healings and signs and miracles and wonders. Let the spirit of the living God move in this place in such a way, Lord God, that you cannot be denied, you cannot be ignored. Hmm. God, that was a strange thing you just did. My mind is blown over it. Thank you, Lord God for bringing people to our remembrance and give us a grace, God, to pray for them and to speak life about them and to them in the moments, God, that we remember our friends. Any way, God, that any of us have ever partnered with the enemy concerning anybody in our, in our life, God, we repent right now. And we pray, Father God, sir, for a brand new grace, just like what you demonstrated, God, to remember our friends, to pray for them, to speak well of them, to honor them.
That's the Lord. Is there anybody here tonight in the presence of the Lord? You guys on altar team? Yeah, you're here. Thank you. Is there anybody here tonight that you go, you know what? I, I should have repented over the weekend and I should have took that serious. I'm afraid I didn't. And you heard God speak tonight. Just saw a miracle just happen. You, I don't know if you guys recognize it or not. You just saw a miracle happen. That was a crazy cool miracle. That was an unusual miracle. Do you know what I first thought when I was talking about Sharon and then I looked over and saw her? I thought, my God, there's an angel. That was the first thing I thought. Was there Sharon's angel right over there? And it took me a few minutes. I was like looking at you and looking at your friend and your friend was like, this is Sharon Bolin right here. And that was, that was cool. <laughs> I'm glad y'all saw that. That was cool. But maybe if you, didn't, if you didn't take repentance serious over the weekend, and if you don't live a life of repentance, where you're, I'm not talking about constantly trying to get saved, but man, where you're somebody who's like, like no, I live in a spirit of repentance. I'm offered that. And if you didn't take that serious, if there is anybody here tonight, and you're like, you know what? I just thought I would be okay, and I don't think I'm gonna be okay. I have to give my whole heart to King Jesus. Is there anybody here tonight in the presence of the Lord? Just raise your hand right there where you're at. Just say, I'm giving my whole heart to King Jesus. There you go, brother. Awesome. I see you over there. Just say, I'm doing that tonight. Tonight is the night that I'm doing that. Hallelujah. And like, no, I, no, I'm going all the way in. I will not have divided loyalty. Listen, your loyalty is everything to the Lord. I will not have divided loyalty. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, he says. In the Old Testament, it's a, it's, I'm sorry, in the, in the King James it says, so that you won't be double-minded, right? In the newer translations it says, so that your loyalty will not be divided. By the way, that's, that's a 4-8 scripture. <laughs> that's a 4-8 scripture, it is. Father God, I lift up all my friends that just now raised their hands and said, no, my loyalty belongs to you and I haven't crossed that line and I need to cross that line. I'm all the way in. I feel your presence here today. And Father, I want to pray, God, in the mighty name of King Jesus, God, that you would move in such a way where there is never an issue for the rest of our lives over who we are devoted and loyalty to in our heart, in our mind, in the way that we live in our marriages, in our, in our speech, in the way we remember things. Thank you, Lord. Everybody say, Jesus, please forgive me. I'm all the way in. I need you, sir. All of you. So please take all of me. All my life. All my heart. All my mind. All of me. Holy Spirit, fill me up with your amazing presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what a wild night. What an interesting night. Different, different night. I never got to my sermon, but it was cool to talk about Jonah tonight. It was good to talk about it. It was good to do that, and it was good to see Sharon. Man, Sharon, that's blowing my mind. Man, that's fun. Do you know that Sharon actually found my book? She was also, too, I'll tell you something else cool about Sharon. She actually found my, my book at uh, the Big Baptist College in Fort Worth and said, hey, I was in their library, and I found your book, Numbers That Preach in there. And it was a thing that started me looking. And then when 2016 happened, and all these theological seminaries all over the world started putting it in their libraries. Sharon was the, she's up there studying because she's a study freak. I'm talking about she is a student in the world. Hey, you guys will know a story that Sharon, and Sharon, you don't know I tell this story all the time. Have you guys ever heard me tell the story? I knew a girl when I was young, 
and she would get all dressed up and clean up her house. She'd get up at like three o'clock in the morning and she would wear beautiful makeup and she would get dressed as good as she could to clean up her house spotless and then seek the Lord that way. That was Sharon. That's who I, that's who I was talking about. <laughs> Guys, we bless you, Sharon. It's great to see you, ma'am. Guys, look, our altar teams are open up here. If you need ministry here tonight, you don't got to just run home. You can let us pray for you. We're going to be doing ministry up here for a while. I love y'all so much. I'm grateful y'all are here. I'm starting a brand new sermon series this coming Sunday, and I will get to it in Jesus' name. I will. I won't be so crazy this coming Sunday. And, uh, well, relatively speaking, amen. I know that you guys that have traveled in from out of state to be here because of the eclipse and all that. It was great to have you guys here. We had we have people from over 40 nations was here on, on Sunday and Monday, which is ridiculous. And um, something like, I don't know, like a, uh, wait, it's reversed. 40 states was here and it was 12 nations or something like that. And so that, I had that, had read that. I got a little bit of Lex Dixia sometime. Hallelujah. All right, guys. I love you guys. God bless you so much. If you need ministry here, let us pray for you here tonight. Come on up here. Come on up here and let us minister to you. Let the Spirit of the Lord move upon you here tonight. God bless you so much, guys. I love you all. Good night, everybody.